Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Aram. I'm the Dean of UCI School of Education. It is my great honor uh, today, not just to welcome Deborah Ball, our distinguished speaker here to join us for National Teacher Appreciation Day, but to celebrate the teachers here in our community that do so much in making a difference every day. And uh, I really want to say, There is perhaps no better time in our country's history than to celebrate teachers today in a period where there's growing political polarization, intolerance and hatred towards people different from oneself. It is a time for teachers and education to provide a path forward and for the community to come together in forums and in venues such as this to celebrate teachers and the value of education in paving a path forward. Now, uh, I'd like to get, uh, I'm gonna just boast a little bit because I'm a dean and that's what I'm paid to do. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to my associate dean, uh, uh, Elizabeth Van Ness, to uh, say a few more words about the Teacher Academy and welcoming Deborah Ball. But, uh, since last year, this is our, now our second annual Teacher Appreciation Day, and for a school that's only four years old, I don't think we have a second annual anything other than this, so I feel like we're, we're starting to build traditions, and this is a good one. Uh, since last year's event, when we welcomed uh, Pedro Noguera down from uh, UCLA, a distinguished professor at uh, UCLA, uh, We've accomplished a lot as a school and as a community. We've integrated the Center for Educational Partnerships at UCI in with the School of Education, organizing all the outreach work that the university does under the School of Education. We've launched a network improvement community in Orange County. We've started with six schools spread out through Santa Ana, San Juan Capistrano, uh, Anaheim, We've had six schools where we have doctoral students embedded full time in these sites doing research that the site leaders deem as important and significant. And we're building them, bringing them together into a network improvement community. We're building from six, we're hoping to have 12 next year and 18 the year after. We've had incredible growth in externally funded research. Uh, when I came and started here three years ago, the school faculty brought in $10 million a year in external funded research. Last year, I told you at, uh, the, at this event that we were up to $21 million in externally funded research. And this year, I'm happy to say we are up to $34 million in externally funded research. And uh, that's... Uh, we're very proud of that because that's money to fund our work in the community, money to fund doctoral students, and money to, fu to fund solutions to the nation's problems around education. Uh, we've grown our faculty. Last year we had 34 faculty. We're up to 38 this year. We uh, have moved up in the national rankings that uh, uh, the U.S. News does from 25 now to 24 in the national rankings. Again, not so bad for a school only four years old. And uh, most, the thing we're most proud of in terms of, of accomplishments is that we've launched something called the UCI Teacher Academy. With the generous support and seed funding from Schools First Credit Union, we uh, have put together a teacher academy to be able to provide greater partnership and service to teachers in our community um, and to host events like this that are open to, uh, to teachers. I now would like to introduce uh, my associate dean, Elizabeth Van Ness, one of the nation's leading figures in teacher education, uh, to say a little bit more about the teacher academy and to in introduce our distinguished speaker. Welcome everyone. This is such an exciting day to bring people together to celebrate teachers. It's so rare that we have that opportunity to do this, so I'm grateful that you've taken some time out to be with us today. 
Um, so the UCI Teacher Academy is an organizing structure that brings professional learning to the broader Orange County community. We talked a little bit about this last year, but our work in the past year has been trying to set a mission and to give ourselves some direction. So with faculty in the School of Education and some of our leaders in the Center for Educational Partnership, we've developed a mission for what we are committed to. We really want to create a setting and a structure that brings educators together to collaborate and de to develop and provide research-based research -based learning experiences for teachers and school leaders. We're committed to trying to develop a community that inspires local communities to engage in continuous improvement. And we really think hard about how we develop capacity on the ground to lead sustained school improvement all in the service of advancing equity and access and opportunity to transform student schooling experiences and ultimately their lives. So the way we've carved this out over the past year is we think about this coming in four different structures. So we start with teacher preparation. We've done a lot of work in the School of Education over the last five to six years to think hard about how we're preparing teachers, what we're committed to, and how we're doing that work. But we all recognize that teacher preparation is just the beginning of the career. We also think hard about teacher professional development. Teachers are learning throughout their careers. So what does it mean? How do we do that well? What do we offer to teachers? And how do we bring teachers in as thought partners to offer high quality professional development? Teachers are also becoming leaders on the ground. I've talked with some of you, some of you who are former students, you're becoming, um, you're becoming your, uh, your uh, district leaders, you're becoming your department chairs, you're taking on roles as teachers on special assignment. What does it mean to do that work? How do we prepare people to do that work? How do we do that in um, ambitious ways? And then finally, administrators set the conditions for all of this work to happen in local schools. So how do we work together with districts and with school leaders to create conditions for professional learning so that you all, the people who do the work day to day, are transforming opportunities for youth? So we think about this not just as all these little bins that are separate, but they're all together. They're all coordinated, and we really think hard about collaborating, inspiring, and leading with you folks being the people who are doing that work. So I can think of few people who help um, set the stage for that kind of work. Um, uh, Deborah Ball comes to mind. Um, I first met Deborah Ball when I was a graduate student, and I'll date myself by saying it was about over 20 years ago. And um, I was learning, I, I went to graduate school interested in learning how to design and study professional learning opportunities, particularly for beginning teachers. Um, I had taught for about four years and was disgruntled with my own professional learning opportunities. I felt very isolated. So I went to graduate school wanting to understand um, how do you do that work better? And I came upon, upon Deborah Ball's research. She might not know this, but my first year at AERA, which is a big conference for education researchers, my colleague and I, or my friend and I followed her around to every session. We just wanted to hear everything she had to say. Um, and what struck me so much about Deborah's work is that her work unveils the deep, deeply complex nature of teaching and learning to teach. And that contrasts sharply with the way our society envisions the work of teaching. So it's, it's amazing how she can really take something that people think is so simple and really unveil how complex that work is. Um, her work is very theoretical, but at the same time, it's extremely grounded in the specifics of the work of teaching. She doesn't live in the ivory tower, she lives in the classroom. And third, her work matters. It matters for research, it matters for teachers, and it matters for the students in her classrooms, particularly for students who have been underserved by institutions of education. And finally, for me, what I find so exciting about Dr. Uh, Deborah Ball's work, is it holds promise. It holds promise for the ways that we as researchers can be accountable to do the work that we're doing and do it better. Um, it shows promise for teachers on how to continuously improve, not just their practice, but schools as a whole. And it shows promise for improving the life chances of children and youth through improving the work of classroom instruction. Dr. Ball's accomplishments are many. Um, in addition to serving as the William H. Payne Collegiate Professor of Education at the University of Michigan, where she also served as the Dean of the School, she's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education. She's also a fellow of the American Educational Research Association and the American Mathematical Society. I'm sure that that list does not do justice to all of her accomplishments. Um, I hope you will find her presentation both inspiring and an 
affirmation of why we have all chosen this field. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's really a, such a great honor. I can't think of something I've been invited to do as long as I can remember that honors me as much as being asked to be the speaker on National Teacher Appreciation Day. And I really um, applaud the School of Education for having a day that centers teachers, since that's, that is why we're here. So how many people in the room right now are practicing teachers or otherwise work in school districts? Up high. Okay, let's give all these people a round of applause. So just not to leave anyone out, how many of you have been teachers and worked in districts but currently do other things to support teaching? OK. So. If you do something else that supports teaching that I haven't named, thank you for being here also. But today is National Teacher Appreciation Day. So um, the title of my talk, as you can see, is The Power of Teaching. I hope that when you leave here today, that whatever role you do play or have played or are going to play, you see this talk as empowering and as giving you hope because we're going to dig into some things that are complicated about our work, and I don't want this to feel paralyzing. I want it to feel empowering. So think about that as you move through it. Before I start, I want to name uh, two kinds of invisibility that are important to me and I hope to you that lead to the fact that teaching itself is invisible in many ways and our work is about making that work more visible. But before I turn to that, the first thing I would like to do is to acknowledge that wherever we travel in this country, we're always standing on other people's stolen land. And here, right here in Irvine, we're standing on Tongva land. I'm not going to go into the history about how, what land was promised to these people that never was given to them, the kind of disease and murdering that followed the conflicts in this area. But I could tell you the same story wherever I go. And I think it's important for us to understand that that's not history, that's actually present, that we are still always standing on indigenous people's land and not necessarily being welcome to be there. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that because that has been an invisibilized part of our own education for many of us. So I hope that wherever you go, you will think to find out whose land you are visiting and are on and respect the land and the water in time immemorial of those people. The second thing, thank you. The second kind of invisibility are um, all kinds of people who made this event possible. And they're people who sent out the notifications. They're people who made this building look the way it looks today. They're people from the School of Education who were welcoming us and they're setting up food and many, many things that I'm sure I can't name. And those people often are left invisible as well. And the events like this don't happen without people doing that kind of labor on our behalf. So one thing you can do today is as you see people who are doing things to make this event happen who are here, you can thank them. And we can all work together to make people who do that kind of work for us much more visible and the recipients of our um, appreciation. So please join me in that as well. And finally, as I said, the invisible power of teaching is the subject matter of my talk. So we'll turn next to that. Um, I want to start by just sort of making a clear assertion, which is, what do we know about teaching? I'm going to make three statements about it today. And the first is just that teaching is powerful. But I want you to think about this in rather subtle ways. Um, and I'll try to open that up next. So, um, some of you know this, and there will be some things here that I know some of you have heard before, and I hope that it won't be boring, but I hope for some of you this won't be, um, won't be something you've heard before. So last year, as I traveled around the country, I decided that something I wanted to do was to interview people about teachers that they had had. And I travel a lot, and I decided to have the hubris to just go up to people I didn't know and say, you know, I'm a teacher, and I'm interested about the experiences people have had with their teachers, and I'd like to know whether you ever had a teacher who had a significant impact on you. And over the next several months, I had the opportunity to talk with many people. What was interesting to me was that out of the 50 plus people I approached, only one person 
declined to talk to me. And what instead happened is that every other person I approached immediately began to name a teacher and talk to me. So then I said, well, wait, would you be willing to let me videotape you while you talk because I'm trying to collect these? And people were very willing to do that. I, I got their permission. I don't know where the communications people are. I got permissions appropriately. <laughs> um, and just used my, my iPhone to film them. And I'm not going to show you the movie today, but I do want to say a few things about it. And if you're interested, it's, I can tell you where you can find it because it's very moving. But the point actually is that there were several themes in what people told me. And first, I just want you to see the images of these people. I think, although we won't go into it, I think you can see that they range sort of of people of different ages, of different racial and ethnicity, of races and ethnicities. And if you knew more, you could see other things that make them diverse. Some of these people grew up in, this, in the United States and some did not. They're all over the age of 20 and up to the age of 80. I had decided originally that I wanted to talk to adults and not to children, although it would have been natural in a way, since I'm an elementary school teacher, to just talk to children over a year and find out about their experiences of us. But I got this idea from a graduate student um, at the University of Michigan named Kim Ransom, who for something else had coined this idea of once children, a hyphenated term. And I thought about it and thought, well, these people were all once children. We were all once children. We are all once children. And that once children could be a source of interesting insight about the power of teaching. So that's who these people are. They're all once children. Um, the themes that stood out were the following. The stories that were positive impacts were all about having feel, felt seen, noticed, valued, thought to be powerful, thought to be smart, thought to be capable, thought to be going somewhere. And they were in moments of sudden, like something really amazing was said by a teacher to them that changed how they saw themselves. Sometimes it was over a school year. Sometimes it was a moment. Some of the things people said were, my teacher spoke my language and I felt comfortable in her classroom. Some of them were, I was in a school where we were just one of the many, but my teacher saw me and gave me opportunities to do things and valued me. Those were the themes. And then themes about impact that was harmful were just the reciprocal of that. My teacher said something that indicated she didn't trust me, that he didn't think I could learn, didn't see me, didn't know me, didn't know my name, and on and on. So they were really complimentary. Nobody said, nobody said, the teacher I remember is the one who turned me on to Shakespeare or the person who explained force to me. That doesn't mean that those people didn't also do that. But what people were remembering was moments that, about their relationships, about how they were seen, valued, or not. And I think that was very powerful. And I think you can assume that the intersectionalities of the identities here shaped the kinds of experiences they had. So I give you that, and I consider this to be a powerful source of data for something probably many of you already believe, which is that teaching is powerful. We may not spend enough time, and maybe on Teacher Appreciation Day it may strike you as odd, but we need to remember the power of teaching to do harm as well as the power of teaching to do good. And it's on that that I'm going to focus today. So another source of evidence, of course, is what we think of as research. I consider this to be research. But another source of research is the growing body of research on teaching effects. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a glimpse of that to support my claim that teaching is powerful. So I tried to group these into sort of clusters of types of research on teaching and the effects that teaching can have. So in the left-hand column are what I'm categorizing as compound effects. So this is research that shows that not only can an individual teacher or an experience of good teaching affect a child's life or an experience of unskillful teaching negatively impact a child's life, but that it's um, compounded over time. So that having, for example, two or three teachers in a row who are grossly underprepared and although they mean well, don't do well in trying to help children learn or do harm in the way they practice punishment and the like, the compounding effect magnifies the effect of the harm and similarly compounds the effect of the good. And we have lots of places in this country where children are, over time, experiencing either very good teaching or very unskilled teaching. So those are compound effects. The next category that I'd like to just comment on is long-term effects. And that has to do with what the longer term effect is of having teachers who do particular things. So the one that I chose to highlight was the research that shows that children who don't learn to read by proficiently by the end of third grade are four times as likely to drop out of high school. So that's an example of a long-term effect of something that happens early in a child's life as a function of teaching and has a much longer effect. And there are lots of other studies of this type. <laughs> 
And the third category I decided to highlight has to do with discipline, although I've lately been thinking that, um, and I got this idea from Richard Milner, who is a faculty member um, at Vanderbilt, that we should really be calling this punishment and not discipline, because discipline is actually a good thing, and we've let that word become co-opted by the fact that we have severely disproportionate punishment practices in schools. It still says discipline here, but I ask you to consider that language too. Um, and this is the research that shows the disproportionality of punishment practices for black and brown children, for indigenous children, and the ways in which, as a function of subjective judgments of teachers, the kinds of punishments are much harsher and much more frequent for children in these groups. And we're going to come back to that later in this talk. But these are different kinds of evidence from research about the powerful, both positive and negative effects of teaching. So the second thing I want to claim, besides that teaching is powerful, is that teaching involves enormous discretion, and that how that discretion is exercised can either reproduce oppression and inequity or it can disrupt it. And so here's the part where I want you to go away, whether you're a supervisor or a classroom teacher or you're a curriculum director for a school district or whatever role you have or are going to have, you're a researcher on teaching, that this discretion is exactly where you have power to exercise for good. And so this is where I want you to think about what that power looks like. In order to set this up, I do want to say a little bit about how I understand teaching and how it's situated in a broader set of environments and then try to explain what I mean by discretion. So this is a very messy looking model of how I think about teaching. So the inside of the diagram basically says something pretty obvious, which is that what's going on in classrooms is a function of interactions between students with one another, with teachers and their students, about whatever they're talking about. I put stuff because it might not be content, it could be you know, a current event, it could be something happening that's happening in the school community. They're interacting about something. Often it is content, but it could be other things. And the arrows go multiple ways because it's all very interpretive stuff. So teachers already have ideas about whatever it is they're talking to kids about that they bring with them, but they're also shaping the way that stuff is presented to or encountered by children. Children are encountering one another and shaping one another's experiences too. They're saying things to one another under their breath, they're passing notes, they're texting, they're commenting on one another's ideas during class. They're hearing things from one another. And again, these are all like interactive. And students are both perceiving their teachers and teachers are perceiving and interpreting their students and on and on. So all of that's inside the classroom and that's obvious. And one way to think about that is that the better teaching that I was just referring to has to do with teachers who are able to manage those dynamics in ways that make it much more likely that the experiences of the people at the top, the students, are positive and help them flourish. And teachers who are less skillful are less skillful at managing all those dynamics. And herein comes the point about discretion. So around the classroom, I have kind of a dotted, porous like membrane, so to speak, to say teaching doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's sitting in a much larger soup of environments. And that soup is much bigger than this talk. But those environments contain all kinds of things. They obviously include things like the communities in which children and families live and the ways in which those do or don't permeate schools. They, but they also include the legacy of slavery in this country, the history of, of racism and oppression to many groups of people, um, policy, the policy environments. We're all talking all the time about the policies that shape teaching and learning. And here the point is, and I'm not going to name all the histories and all the policies and all the influences, they seep inside of schools. And they seep inside of schools in lots of different ways through the curriculum, through teachers who grow up in, these, in this society and we carry with us the things that we've learned in school, the things that we've experienced by living in a society that's filled with racism, for example. We bring those in our bodies and in our ways we see and students are as well. However, this is also good because if you want, like some of this is good, if you want classrooms to be responsive to their environments, the classroom has to be permeable. If it weren't, then schools would be operating with a tight membrane and nothing about students' out-of-school knowledge or resources could come inside of school. So to teach in culturally responsive ways, you want the classroom to be permeable. You want things that kids bring to school to be part of the classroom. So this isn't all evil, it's just that it works both ways. And before you make an argument like, we need to relax all controls on classrooms, it's worth understanding that evil stuff comes in through that membrane and good stuff can also come in. So it raises a paradox for our profession, which is on one hand, there's too much constraint on us, preventing us from doing the kind of work that's important to be doing with young people, but there's also so little, so little constraint 
because in the discretion that we have, all kinds of things get reproduced for children that are actually not so good for them. In this talk, I'm going to concentrate primarily on the relational work between teachers and students. I could give the same talk by talking more about the influences on the curriculum, because that's also a place where you see this paradox of how much should it be responsive to the local communities and the students who are in that class? How much should it be actually help to be shaped by a larger set of influences and whose knowledge is in the curriculum and the like. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk much more about the everyday relational work and how discretion shapes that. So to do that, we're going to look inside a classroom very closely. So I've been talking about big forces like colonialism and the legacy of slavery and policy, all really big things. But my argument is those big things find their way inside the microdynamics of classrooms. So I'm going to take a microscope now and zoom in on a classroom. So in this classroom, um, the, it's an elementary math class of children who are 10 and 11 years old. Um, the problem that they're working on is this one. Uh, if you haven't taught elementary school or fourth grade ever or recently, you might think this looks really obvious. It's basically asking what number is at the point where the orange arrow is pointing. I'm going to assume that everybody here recognizes that that number is one third. But a couple of things to notice are, first of all, that it says what number and not what fraction. So the problem is designed on purpose to be supporting children to learn, which is a common core standard, to learn that numbers, there are all kinds of numbers on the number line, and they're not all integers, and that the numbers that we call fractions are actually numbers. And it's, it's a hard transition for children because most of the work on fractions is like parts of cookies and parts of pizzas and parts of pans of brownies, which is also fractional, but isn't the same thing as thinking of one third as a number. So it, doesn't, it says number on purpose. And the children had just recently begun to encounter the number line as a place that just filled, 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 filled with numbers. This is not an easy problem for them. And in this classroom that has 30 children, I'll tell you the demographics just because when you watch, it might be helpful to know there are 22 of them are black, four of them are Latinx, and four of them are white. They're all 10 and 11 years old. Um, of the 30 children, 26 of them have a number other than one third after thinking about it on their own and talking to like a partner. So we're gonna watch the beginning of a discussion where you should know that most people don't think it's one third. Um, and that's just good to know. And that's because it's not an easy thing to figure out. Maybe take a moment and turn to the person next to you in case somebody near you is an expert at 10 year olds um, and see if you can predict what some other answers might have been besides one third, just so you're ready to watch. So take just about 30 seconds and see if you can name some other things children might have thought it was. Okay, let's come back together. Let's come back together. So some things you might have thought of were like one fourth or two fourths. Maybe some of you could predict that somebody might think it's one. Um, you might not have predicted that somebody thought it was negative one. Um, one half. Anything else? That's a re reasonable range, and they were spread out. And of the children who did have one third, none of them really had an explanation. The problem says explain how it's one third, and most of them, they didn't have an explanation. Listen closely and see what you think about her reasoning and her answer. Um, I put one seventh because there's. Did she say one seventh? Yeah. Shit. Because there's um, seven equal parts, like one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Before you agree or disagree, I want you to ask questions if there's something you don't understand about what she did. No agreeing and disagreeing, just all you can do right now is ask Anaya questions. Who has a question for her? Okay, Tony, what's your question for her? <laughs> what? Did... Go ahead, it's your turn. Why did you pick one seven? Thank you. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so let's just step out for a moment. I'm going to put that diagram back up. And remember, I'm focusing on this sort of relational work between teachers and students and students and students. And I'm going to put a transcript of, of that segment plus a tiny bit more. But it's about a minute and 28 seconds, starting a little earlier than what I showed you. That's the transcript. You don't have to read it. But every line of either movement or talk is on this transcript. That's all you need to know right now. Um, and what I'm about to explain is there are 20 lines there in a minute and 28 seconds. And I want to highlight something for you about discretion, is that at every one of those lines, teaching involves the exercise of discretion. So for every moment that those of you who are currently teaching feel over constrained by the larger environment, I want you to see that all the things I'm going to show you, nobody could be controlling. These are all moments of discretion. So the first is what the teacher does to open the discussion. No matter how you know, Byzantine your textbook is or your school district, you're never going to be told exactly how to begin a discussion. So there are many ways you can begin a discussion. You could say, who would be willing to come and tell us what the answer is? That's a completely different bid. And you can, I'm sure, think of several others that you could do that would begin a discussion. You might not begin a discussion at all. You might have a turn and talk. Those are all different ways to start. And no textbook tells you exactly what words to use even to open a group discussion. So that's a moment of discretion. And each of those choices actually does something different. They're not all equivalent. Another is a nonverbal moment, which you probably noticed that there were children kind of like laying around like that on their arms. So that's another moment of discretion. You can respond to that. You could not respond. You could say something like, I'm not going to continue till everyone sits up and looks at the board. You might call a student out. You might say, you know, um, Dante, I need you to sit up right now. Um, any number of things could be said, um, or nothing. Um, Dante himself, at the point when Tony speaks at the end, says something across the room to her like, you did not. And again, that's another moment where the teacher can say, what are we supposed to do when we're having a group discussion? A teacher could say, Dante, I need you to step out until you're re willing to listen to the discussion. The teacher could ignore Dante. There are lots of things. That's another moment of discretion. And I could go over all those lines, and every one of them, either non-verbally or verbally, is a moment where the teacher either does something or doesn't do something, and nothing is neutral. So I get that idea from my colleague, Imani Goffney, who points out that nothing's neutral. Not doing something is doing something, and doing something is doing something. But my big point is that all of those moments of discretion <laughs> There are tons of them all going on in the way the teacher is perceiving the students, talking to the students, the students are talking to one another, and the students are hearing from and interpreting their teacher. And my big point here that's the central point of my talk is that teaching is dense with these discretionary spaces. So there are these discretionary spaces filling our practice all of the time, many of them unconscious, and in many of those spaces we're acting in out of habit and out of custom, we're not necessarily deciding to do all of these things. We're not really deciding to ignore a particular behavior or to respond in a particular way. Sometimes we are. Teaching is very deliberate work. But there's too much of this for us to be deciding every. These are not all decisions. There are spaces where things happen, and they're often happening out of habit. So I want to review the discretionary spaces that I'm focusing on, which is Anaya's answer and Tony, and then think about that. I'm going to focus just on Anaya's answer and Tony's response to her as an example of a discretionary space. So I think that's actually like number 19 in the transcript. OK, ready? I put one seventh because there's. Did she say one seventh? Yeah. Why did you pick one OK, so let's try to look at these discretionary spaces. So Tony says early on, did she say one seventh? Kind of sotto voce, like as, as um, Anaya is speaking, she asks that. You can hear her say, did she say one seventh? Then later, Tony says why and laughs at Dante. Why, why did you pick one seventh? Why did you pick one seventh? So those are all discretionary spaces. So there's Anaya, there's Tony. And the point is that in those moments, the moves of the teacher can either reproduce the marginalization of black girls and very reductionist views of math or not. So these are consequential discretionary mo moments in the teaching. So I'm going to invite you to think for a moment in the following way. What do you think 
given your expertise and your experience, I'm not asking you right now what you would do, what you might say to Anaya or what you might say to Tony or not say or not do, but I want you to think about what you think is normal. What do you think might get said to Anaya? What do you think might get said to Tony? So I just want you to turn and talk, and here I'm literally not asking you what you would do, but what do you think is likely, is very commonly what might be said to either girl? So Anaya has said one seventh, that's one case, and Tony has said, why did you pick one seventh and laughs and is playing with her hair? So ten and talk, what do you think, is, what do you think are normalized next moves? Okay, let's come back together. Let's come back together. So I'm going, to, um, I'm going to share some that are typical. I've showed this video a lot, so I've gotten this partly from asking people what they think is normal. These might be what you've said or may not be. So and I'm going to, we're going to think about each of them, what the impact is of that. So remember, we're thinking about the power of teaching. So what's the impact of any of these moves? So one that's very common to Anaya would be to say, you know, can someone help Anaya out and show her what we call the hole on the number line? So this kind of, can someone help out the person at the board? Um, is something that would be a very likely thing to be said, because she's just said one-seventh, and one-seventh isn't the answer. So, so what's the result of that? It's re it basically signals that Anaya's answer isn't right, and she's, in some sense, being pushed aside a little bit to get someone else to help move the work along. So that's one kind of result of that move, and that move is very common. Another one could be this kind of ubiquitous, like, Let's, let's all stop right now. Thumbs up if you agree with Anaya, and thumbs down if you don't. Um, it's a very common move. So what's the result of that one? That basically suggests that her answer is something we're going to vote on. Um, I know that's not exactly what we think we're doing when we say that, but it does signal something unusual about why a math question, an answer to a math question, is something we're voting on. And moreover, <laughs> since, it's, since it's an unusual answer, you might think ahead to what's likely. Very few people are going to have their thumb up, right? So. You, you already know if you've been circulating that that's not the pre predominant answer. So then Anaya's at the board and very few people have their thumbs up. So it not only votes on her answer, but to some extent also marginalizes her contribution. And then there's the kind of neutral, you know, what do others think? Um, but that also basically kind of excludes her because the mathematical point she's making, we're moving on from it. Um, so in a minute, we're going to come back to what did Anaya actually contribute? But these things on the left are actually really pretty common responses. And I'm not arguing that a teacher who says these things is like thinking, I'm going to now have it voted on. It's that there's so many things we're doing all the time, and we're not necessarily thinking about the discretion we have to do something different than those things we typically do. But let's think about Tony for a moment also. So again, uh, you already had a chance to think about this, so I'll share a few things that I've typically heard. Um, one is to say, Tony, you know, when you're ready to participate appropriately by not playing with your hair and actually have a question to ask, I'll come back to you. So this I'll come back to you phrase is something that's really common. You're judged as not doing something that's useful. You're publicly excluded. I'll come back to you when you're ready to contribute. Another one that I think is also pretty interesting is to say, you need to be a better listener, Tony. Anaya just explained why it's one seventh, and does someone else have a real question? So then she's being, <laughs> she's being read as not asking a genuine question, as maybe mocking Anaya or playing around. And again, she's judged to not be listening, which is pretty interesting because we have extremely good evidence that she was listening, since she's the one who said, did she just say one seventh? Um, and then there could also be the what do others think. And again, she's, her mathematical point is sidelined. So these common responses that occur in these discretionary spaces have powerful, powerful reproductive effects on the marginalization of black girls. So I'm choosing black girls because that's what it is. I could have done this talk by picking some other group that is oppressed. I could pick black boys and some of the punishment practices. I could pick English language learners and the way their language gets misrespected. I could pick other groups. So the bodies could be different, but we're focusing here on the case we have. I want to think a little bit about my point that these discretionary spaces aren't all deliberate what we do in them, but think what fills them then? What is filling up these discretionary spaces in our practice? Um, again, we have the diagram. So one is what I basically already said, which is the experiences we all have growing up in a society filled with oppression and racism mean that we've learned ways to read other people's bodies, other people's expressions, in this case, black girls. So the interpretation of Tony as mocking Anaya or not listening is a learned 
implicitly learned bias by living in a, in a society in which that's the way black girls and black women are often read. And it isn't something conscious, but <clears throat> people have insisted to me over and over that Tony is mocking Anaya. And I think stopping to think, where do we get that assumption and what makes us so sure about it? And what is it the source of that? But the second thing that might even be more disturbing is that some of these things that we say and do, like maybe the thumbs up, thumbs down, are taught or we learn them in, in school as professionals. We learn them from other teachers. We learn them in all kinds of institutionalized ways that reinforce dominant patterns of what interaction is supposed to look like, what it means to be listening, what it means to be somebody who's participating in class. Those are learned and those reinforce patterns of whiteness and dominant society, dominant values. Now, Teacher education doesn't very effectively intervene on the first. We've tried, I think, many times. I think many people in this country work really hard to think how we help teachers who have grown up in the society, how we help them rethink, or help ourselves rethink assumptions we've made. But teacher education has not had a great track record on that. But professional education also teaches some of these practices. We learn about thumbs up and thumbs down. We learn about what constitutes good listening behavior. We learn about how to speak to children with classroom management practices in teacher education. So it's not just by chance that these habits are seeping inside of schools. So I want to step back out again to think about what all of this means from a more macro perspective. So we have very troubling and you know, very strong research that shows the disproportionate patterns of the way black girls are treated in school. And this study, if you haven't seen it, that um, is called Black Girlhood Interrupted, that was published about two years ago, um, shows, and this is one of the things that the report shows, is what's meant by disproportionality is if you look on the left, black girls comprise one in six of the girls in school, whereas white girls comprise one in two, so 15% or 50%. But watch what happens as you go from um, in school suspensions to single suspensions to multiple suspensions, by the time you get to multiple suspensions, these girls who are one in six of the girl population are over half of the multiple suspensions. And conversely, white girls who are only 50% or 50 of the girls in school comprise only one fifth of the multiple suspensions. That's what's meant by disproportionality. And it's important to understand that this is for subjective judgments. This is not for like bringing a gun to school. This is for being like red like Tony, like fooling around, not listening, being belligerent, maybe bullying or making fun of another child. And so what the research shows very emphatically is that these proportions of uh, punishment, like twice as much or three times as much, are the function of things that are discretionary. They're not objective facts about what girls are doing. They're about the way girls are being read. So if you go back out to those patterns and then you think of the consequences of these discretionary spaces, we have power to change this pattern by acting differently in those discretionary spaces because these things are the product of those. So the question really to end the talk with is what does it take to disrupt these patterns? We're carrying this stuff with us without always knowing that we are. So what does it take to be able to disrupt them? So let's think about these two girls. One part is actually mathematical content knowledge. So that might surprise you that I'm bringing that up now, but you have to be able to see that Anaya said something brilliant. And I'm not sure everybody in here, depending on your experience with elementary school math teaching, can see that, because you actually have to know something to see that. And that's not, I don't mean to offend anybody, it's more to value those of you who actually teach this level, that it takes some knowledge to understand that Anaya not only um, has explained extremely clearly that it's about intervals, she's also shown that you count them from, right, she's written the number one seventh. She's be, been clear that you're not counting tick marks. The only, and she gives a very good explanation. It's a mathematically extremely well-structured explanation. And she's confident in front of her peers at the board. She's able to look at the board and talk to the class, take up a question from a colleague, I mean, that's a lot of competence. The only thing she doesn't have is that she isn't yet comfortable with the idea that the unit interval on the number line is from zero to one always. And there's no reason she should be sure of that yet because that's the new content. And everything else they do with fractions, anything can be the whole. You can have five pizzas to be the whole. You can have half a pizza to be the whole. When you're dealing with area models, the whole is up to you. But with the number line, there's no option. It's always zero to one. She just isn't sure of that yet. But Tony's also doing something mathematically sophisticated. She asks the absolutely most important question is, where are you getting the seven? 
That is what actually has to be figured out. If we're going to get clear about how we decide what the denominator is, you've got to be able to do that. And Tony has one third on her paper with no really good explanation. Now, if you think carefully about it, you could say to yourself, Anaya just explained it so well that Tony's beginning to doubt herself and really does want to hear it again. Or you could say, she's making fun of her because she knows it's not one third. She knows it's not one seventh. That is a choice we're making. There is no way to know why Anat Tony is asking that question. But when we actively fall prey to assuming she's making fun of Anaya, that's how bias is creeping in. So it's, not, it's math knowledge, but it's also trusting Tony and Anaya. It's taking as an axiom that both these girls are smart and capable and are actually trying to work. And that's an assumption that you can take as axiomatic, that you can commit yourself to. But those two things are still like knowledge and beliefs. So you actually have to have something different to do because the habitual things we say all the time as teachers are habit. So you have to have some alternatives to those habits or you're still kind of stuck. So let's watch what does happen. Okay, Tony, what's your question for her? <laughs> what? Go ahead, it's your turn. Why did you pick one seven? Thank you. <laughs> let's listen to our answer now. That was a very good question. Can you show us again how you figured out why you decided one seven? Okay, so this shows one case, nothing brilliant, but of what using discretion to dis deliberately disrupt how those patterns that recur in classrooms uh, marginalize black girls. So in this case, countering the pattern is just simply publicly acknowledging the importance of Tony's question. There's her answer because it's in three parts. It's not an explanation. That's her paper. And to just assume she actually wants to try to understand was she wrong or is Vanaya wrong? Like, what's going on here? Again, there is no way to prove this, but as teachers or as school leaders, we can choose to read children in particular ways, and those choices have consequences. So the result of making that choice is that Tony is trusted. She's seen as making a contribution to the work. The mathematical precision of her question, which is absolutely, I'm going to say again, the right question, it's the right next question, is seen as important. And she's also doing something else which is worth noticing, which is the teacher said no agreeing or disagreeing. And that's something like you really want to do if you're 10 years old. They want to like say, that's not what I think. But she is actually doing that. She's asking a question instead of bringing up her own answer. And that's also very competent. So let's sort of get out of this story and talk about, well, what was the, what was the effect of all of this just on this one day? So the discussion goes on for about 18 more minutes. Um, and I want to say a little bit about what happens. So at the end of that um, 18 minutes, Tony is the one, along with a girl named Jenna, who models at the board what we, that is the class, has come to agree on the way that we understand and identify fractions as numbers on the line. She models an explanation of it at the board, fluently, capably, proudly, okay? Anaya, on her exit ticket, uh, solves a new problem, it's two-fifths, and writes a pretty complete explanation, which includes identification of the whole. She writes, because the whole is from zero to one and there are five equal parts and there were two spaces, so two fifths. So she's now understanding that the whole is from zero to one. But she also writes in her notebook, I did well on my goal today because my goal was to share my ideas with the class. And I did, I went up to the board and share my idea with the class on fractions. There's some evidence that she also feels proud about what she did, uh, as we do with Tony, who's proud about explaining at the end of the lesson. But there are also 28 other kids in this class, so maybe it's a good idea to zoom back out to figure like, okay, great for Tony and Anaya, but what about everybody else? So first of all, of the 30 children, now 27 of them are able to get the exit ticket correct and give explanations. So that 18 minutes was worth having. Um, but it's also worth seeing that they saw two black girls being smart because other children are learning or aren't learning bias also in school. So how children get treated in school is what other children are learning too. So if in a classroom, the black boys are always the ones being sent out of a discussion, other children in the class are learning black boys are bad. So other children are learning things from the decisions we make, not just how it affects those children. So I wanna wrap up by saying that the work of trying to disrupt injustice lives inside the work we do. I guess I wanna say one other thing about this before I conclude. Had the teacher been black and the boy who, and Tony had been a white boy, 
There's a different dynamic that goes on, but there's still this question of discretion and how we're reading the bodies and what it means for what happens to children. So this is a particular case with a white teacher and black girls, but you can, you can imagine different variations where the story is a bit different, but the issues are the same about discretion. So what do I mean by this? The first part is that in order to work effectively in that complicated space with that soup surrounding us, we have to actually think a lot about ourselves, about who we are. I'm a white woman teacher. I grew up in a particular part of this country. The things I carry with me are part of that. But other people in the room, you grew up in other places. There are people here who are black teachers. There are people here who have other identities. You're bringing other things. But we all did grow up, if we grew up in this country, in that soup. And that does interact with who we are. But we have to understand what our part and our own histories have to do with that. A second is to do what I asked you to do a little bit today, was to know what normally happens and to be able to be conscious of what that does to reproduce oppression and no longer take it so much for granted is obviously fine that we do some of these things because they've come to be normal, so we don't necessarily think they're egregious or bad. Um, we have to learn to see and affirm each of the children we teach, both their strengths and their academic work, and that will reward us. But that's something we can do with that discretion by trusting them, by seeing them as capable. And there's a lot of work on content, although this talk hasn't been about that. There's about the opening up of content that makes it possible for children to be successful with it and to broaden what it means to be successful. So in math, it means having a broader view of what brilliance in math means. If it's only about getting one third, that's a really narrow opening to be good at math. But if it's about giving a good argument, as well as figuring out that it's one third, not one or the other, but both, that's a broader space that we're better cultivating children's ability to be competent. So I'm going to conclude with two small things. One is a quote that I love from Marcel Haddix, who is an English educator at Syracuse University, who reminds us that teaching, and this is, I think, great for Teacher Appreciation Day, is a revolutionary act. And that reaching for the possibilities and the power of the work that we do can be our collective work. We can learn to do this better together and to use the discretion we have in ways that actually advance justice in this society. We have that power. I'm gonna end with the words of one of the people I interviewed. Uh, when I told you that story that I interviewed people all over the country, I'm gonna let one person have the last word here. His name is Brandon. He's a black man who lives in Bakersfield, California. And he tells a story about his teacher who made a difference to him. And I want you to hear that. And that's the end of my talk. So is there a teacher you remember from sometime in your past who had an important impact on you? Yes, uh, Miss Smith is my first grade teacher. Um, so in order to help you understand, provide a little context, uh, I, I grew up in a, a very uh, rough part of um, the United States. I grew up in East St. Louis, um, Illinois. And it was the first time that uh, I had an individual who, who really showed that, that love, that, that genuine care that you can just pierce through your soul and feel that the effects of this person will have a, an impact on my life. Um, Ms. Smith was, you know, your traditional teacher with the sweater, with the, the skirt, um, and she was a, a Caucasian woman. But one thing she understood was um, that there's something that she saw in me that um, no one else saw. Um, things that I would uh, get in trouble for um, later on in life, uh, I look back and reflect that, you know, Miss Smith would let me um, lay on the floor and do my, my work. She would let me, um, you know, be out of my seat as long as I'm touching my seat. Um, in any form. So I really uh, appreciate what, what she has done for me and how she helped me on my teaching career as far as understanding the, the needs of students and what students um, bring to school with them. Some students bring a backpack and some students bring luggage and we have to be able to uh, respond to those individual needs and understanding and let them be the individuals that they, that they strive to be. How is that different from other teachers you had at other points? Did you have other kinds of experiences with teachers that were not like that? Well, um, you know, most of the time you'll, you'll quickly find out or learn how to play what we call a school, um, code switching to an environment which um, other individuals deem um, should be the way that, that you should act, that you should conduct yourself. Um, but understanding that it's sometimes difficult for students to um, take on the challenge of uh, 
enter in a system in which, um, you know, as an African American male, that we're not necessarily accustomed to or, or welcome um, in a sense. Uh, yes, the doors are open. Yes, we attend every day. But uh, within the, the schema of the individual who's educating us, are we welcome? Are there, um, you know, evident uh, biases that, that are shown through that often as times adults we don't see, um, but they're there. Um, students and, and kids see those type things. And those are some of the experiences I had as I, as I got older. <laughs> I think we have time for like two questions. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about that video. It's beautiful. Um, it's um, so I, I think, like, I was a UCI grad, and I think it's a beautiful program, and I'm so grateful I went through it. But one thing, that I think I've heard from all of my friends who are teachers that they didn't have was um, conversation. Do you need a mic? Uh, conversation about the power dynamics and uh, between the teacher and the student. And the majority, I think there were three uh, students of color in the program or in my cohort, and yet the majority were going into schools that were where the, the percentage was 90 plus students of color. And there wasn't a conversation about that. And there wasn't space to have those conversations. And so I feel like so many people went into those spaces not even thinking about it. And so I'm curious when, if you could design or like when you see, do you see certain teaching education programs doing that well? Or what do you think is the role of the teaching education program for pre-service teachers to have those conversations about power dynamics and what that means as uh, a teacher, whether you're, it, especially if you're not a person of color, teaching predominantly students of color. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and not a simple one. I don't, I don't know that any teacher education program has it solved. I'm sure that there are programs that do better and some that don't, and many do what you describe. I'm not commenting on this program, but it's relatively, a relatively colorblind kind of um, approach where we're not actually dealing with the racial, racialization of schooling and the ways in which who the teachers are and who the children, I mean, 80% of the teachers in this country are white and over half the children are children of color. You're giving the local context that so reflects that larger environment. And I think it is an important, it's actually an essential task of professional preparation to figure out how we begin to interrupt that because otherwise we're actually contributing to placing children at harm. We had a conversation here earlier today is what are we giving up then? Because we're not gonna suddenly have 10 year teacher preparation programs. So we have to have that hard conversation about why what you just raised may be one of the most important things to be tackling and let something else go. And I think that's a very important conversation for us to have. And the second part of your question is, what is effective at changing habits? Because if you regard these things as habits, then beliefs do matter and knowledge does matter, but it's also about beginning to learn to say and do different things in those moments. And it can't be paralyzing. It can't be like, oh, I'm never gonna be able to do anything different. You can learn. We know a lot about changing habits. We know a lot about learning to reframe how you see people and change that. So I think your question is great, and it's, my answer is too short, but it's the, right question, it's the right set of questions that we all should be tackling, and we don't have to do it one institution at a time either. Yes? Uh, something that I've learned that I wondered your perspective on. Um, have you seen the TED Talk? It's the beauty of human skin in every color. And I think it's, uh, it's about how we address could you start with the beginning of it again, the beauty of what? Yeah, so it's a TED Talk. Is this coming through okay? Yeah. The TED Talk, and I recommend it to everybody, is the beauty of human skin in every color. It has two million plus views. And what I learned about it that I think would help everybody is how we identify different skin tones. And that talking in kind of more dualistic black and white may not always be beneficial to everybody or their interpretation. And, and I didn't realize that before, but that's what I'd encourage everybody to, to see is the beauty of human skin color, human skin in every color. And I yeah. just wonder what your perspective was on that. 
Well, it's a very, thank you for sharing that. And of course, it's very complicated because the history of race in this country isn't directly about skin color at all. It's about, it's about oppression and white supremacy. So it's complicated. So yes, and also, or, uh, yes, and kind of there are other things that have to be tackled about the ways in which um, racial bias creeps in independent of exactly. But of course, there are skin issues as well. But I think the problem of learning to see, understand how racial bias permeates our thinking and the way that looks at the way we see bodies and the way we control them is a really important problem. And I, I haven't seen that TED Talk. I would like to see it. I think it's important to understand how skin color is and isn't the same as the, as the issue is talking about. But I really appreciate you raising that. Yes. So we know that there aren't enough um, teachers from diverse backgrounds, right? We're, um, so what do we do to increase those numbers? What is happening? Is that a recruitment? What, is, what, what do we do to improve that? To, to get more teachers? Mm -hmm. Just more teachers in no, general? Black teachers, oh. Hispanic teachers. <laughs> well, that's also, I think I'm going to be pushed off the stage here. But um, <laughs> I think the question of how we get a more diverse teaching force has many factors, and I'm not an expert. But one thing that we could be thinking more about is, what is it we think we can teach people in teacher preparation? And what do we think we should be recruiting on? Um, so what we recruit on right now is likely to reproduce the teaching force we have. So if we were to think differently about what we want to recruit on and what we can take responsibility for teaching, which is your question, we might be even to change that. But that doesn't enter into the question of like what are the factors that cause people to want to be teachers. We know that historically people tend to go into teaching who liked school and who enjoyed being there. So if you were a student of color and experienced the sorts of things I'm describing, you're have to have a lot of strength to think I'm going to go out there and tackle that as opposed to I always love that and I'd like to be there. So I think the answer is complicated, but one step could be to re-examine what we assume are the prerequisites for learning to be a teacher. If we thought of relational skill and ability to work across difference as a key prerequisite skill, we might have a different pool. But I don't think that would solve it by itself, and I'm going to step off now. Thank you. <laughs> Before, before we, we let uh, Dr. Ball step off, uh, uh, I just, on behalf of UCI, uh, deeply thank you for the uh, ins insightful uh, comments uh, you shared with us today and uh, bestow upon you as a, a small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to see my bag. I'm going to see my bag. Yeah. Yes, and over dinner we will teach her the uh, anteater zot. Uh, 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 so I'd, um, I, I know everyone wants to get to the reception, but we want to have a few more things to do before um, we move on to that. Uh, I'd like now to introduce uh, Frank Olmos, uh, an alumni at UCI, because we have an exciting news to share. Uh, we have an, uh, an alumnus uh, with us today who's been leading the formation of our new alumni association chapter at the School of Education. Now remember, the School of Education is only four years old. Our alumni chapter is four weeks old, maybe, or so. so but we're very excited about this development. Uh, Dr. Frank almost received his doctorate degree in educational administration and leadership from UCI. He has extensive experience in psychometrics, organizational research, information systems, and educational leadership. He is currently an adjunct professor for the Charter College of Education at California State University, Los Angeles, and senior human resources analyst at Los Angeles County Office of Education. I'd like Frank to say a few words about the exciting development of this new alumni, ch uh, alumni chapter. Wow, a lot of people here. <laughs> okay, um, hello, thank you, Dean Aram. I'm extremely pleased to share with you that we have just launched our new alumni association chapter for the School of Education. Membership is open to all School of Education graduates, uh, emeriti, as well as community friends in the education community. And our, our new alumni association is vastly growing. 
since our launch six weeks ago. <laughs> yes, six weeks ago. We have 130 members. <laughs> That's great. Our goal will be to organize events and programs for sh sharing best practices, mentoring, and networking as well. Also, just to stay connected with faculty, students, and fellow alumni. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet at the registration table, and your gift bag also includes information on how to register using your mobile device. All right, so please use your mobile device to see how you can register. Uh, also, there's an additional incentive. Uh, we have a very fortunate, we, we're very fortunate that one of our sponsors, Mother's Market, has provided gift cards. So the first four individuals that signs up tonight for the alumni chapter will receive a gift card to Mother's Market. So please sign up and hurry up. Oh, wow, there's so many, so many people who already, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, whoa, no, no, I'm just kidding. So, uh, okay, I turn it back to Dean Aram. Thank you. Great, right, thank you. For, we're very, very excited about this development. And uh, so uh, before we close, uh, I want to thank all the sponsors that made this possible. Uh, the school first uh, federal credit union, which uh, underwrote this event, but also um, uh, uh, provided the seed funding for the Teacher Academy. Uh, I'd like to thank Lakeshore Learning, Skibby Learning, uh, Teacher Created Materials, Mother's Market, and last but not least, Balboa Bay Club, because the Balboa Bay Club, they, put, uh, they uh, uh, donated a, um, a weekend retreat uh, that we're gonna now have the raffle and give out a, a weekend retreat at the Balboa Bay Club. So, Paul, uh, I think the coupon, they're on the back of your tags or find your numbers, this is exciting. We can, we can all talk about appreciating and valuing teachers, but there's nothing like a weekend retreat at the Balboa Bay Club for really showing our love. Okay. And I'm, uh, okay. Uh, no, I'm gonna do my best. Six. Okay, uh, six zero eight zero zero five. Oh, a lot of disappointment, but it ends eight zero zero five, and the winner. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We now have a reception where we get to celebrate each other's company and come together as a community on your way out after the reception. Don't forget we have a little gift bag uh, for everyone with a, uh, um, a token of our appreciation for you as teachers. Thank you. Thank you.